Good morning and good afternoon. This is Sylvia Herzog from the Charcoal Project. Welcome to our webinar today, Charcoal Proquette Enterprises, Challenges and Opportunities Based on Experiences in East Africa. Before we dive in today, we're gonna to just go over a couple of housekeeping items. First off, please mute your microphone and keep your camera off for now. We will have a question and answer session at the end and you can put your questions in the chat function and we'll try do our best to get to most of them. Um, to the extent we can't, we will um, answer them in writing and submit them um, back to you uh, when we um, give you the recording and the corresponding slides that are going to be available. So just to let you talk to you a little bit about who the Charcoal Project is. Uh, whoa, sorry. First I'll go through our agenda, sorry. Um, so as I said, I'm Sylvia Herzog, I'm director of the Charcoal Project. Uh, after my short introduction, we're going to have uh, dive into our presenters. First, we'll have uh, Marianne Jenga from iCraft and the University of Nairobi, who's going to talk to us about opportunities for small scale and community led organizations. Um, next, we'll have Matthew Owen, who is a bioenergy consultant and the director at Chardust, who's going to talk to us about uh, scaling commercial ventures and his experience at Chardust. Uh, our third speaker will be Ziwa Hillington, who's the Managing Director of Green Bioenergy in Kampala, Uganda. And Ziwa is going to talk to us about challenges and opportunities for working in an urban setting. Um, finally, we'll uh, finish up with Dorothy Otieno, who's the, who's the CEO of Nyalora Impact in Homo Bay, Kenya. And Dorothy's going to talk to us about working in a rural or peri-urban setting. Uh, after that, we will um, have some time for questions and answers, and, um, and we look forward to having an open discussion with all of you. So just a quick introduction. The Charcoal Project is a US-based nonprofit that promotes better fuels and technologies for people who rely on solid biomass fuel for their everyday cooking needs. We do that by supporting clean energy entrepreneurs uh, through our Harvest Fuel Initiative. And you will see references to some of the entrepreneurs we help in, this, in these presentations. We also provide online resources to stakeholders in the sector, and we advocate for more sustainable practice for wood fuel consumption and production. Oops. Why, why are we here? If my slides will stay in place, uh, that would help. Uh, sorry. So um, the main reason why we're here today is because 3 billion people in the developing world depend on wood and charcoal and other biomass for cooking and heating. And as you all know, this leads to inefficient combustion and unsustainable harvesting of biomass for fuel. And that's associated with negative health, environmental and social impacts. And Africa, where we focus, leads the world in wood energy consumption. So you can see by this chart, um, what a big impact that is. Uh, and, and charcoal and wood fuel can contribute to deforestation and degradation. Primarily agriculture is the main driver of deforestation, but charcoal and firewood are significant drivers of forest degradation. Most forest degradation in Africa is attributable to charcoal and firewood production. And you can see from these graphs that it's, pretty, um, it's um, a pretty big impact. So this is something we're worried about and we're trying to find solutions for. And, and, and one of the reasons we're really worried about it is because uh, biomass fuel consumption is projected to rise by 40% um, in, in 2040 uh, due to increased urbanization and population growth. So the problem isn't gonna go away anytime soon and it's not being um, much impacted by alternatives that are being uh, produced like um, uh, renewables and ethanol and LPG. So one of the things that we do at the Charcoal Project is we try to find many ways to improve the sector. In our first webinar that we had last month, we talked about sustainably um, managing uh, wood fuel sources so that you can have um, sustainable feedstock for wood charcoal. Uh, today, we're going to talk about switching feedstock to alternative sources such as agricultural waste and making that feedstock source into charcoal briquettes. 
So what are charcoal briquettes? I'm sure many of you have seen them, but basically they are made from compressed waste streams of agricultural residues or char dust, or organic waste or wood waste. These briquettes can be carbonized, meaning they've been through pyrolysis and used similar to charcoal, or they can be uncarbonized and used like wood. Uh, they come in many shapes and sizes. As you can see from these pictures, these are different entrepreneurs that we work with in Kenya and Uganda, and they produce waffle shaped and round and agglomerated and extruded. And there's lots of different shapes uh, that come with different technologies and also um, depending on what consumers are like and are used to. Presently, we're focusing on carbonized briquettes as it's most relevant for household and small business use. Um, uncarbonized briquettes would need a, a, a very good wood stove to use. So we see a lot of benefits to developing the charcoal briquette sector. Um, there's economic, economic, environmental and health benefits. Um, working, working with this sector creates jobs. There's income generation throughout the value chain. A lot of women are in this sector, so you're empowering women. You see energy savings for consumers because briquettes generally burn longer. Uh, you clean up waste streams and use a renewable feedstock, so there's less, there's less pressure on forest degradation. And for the most part, they're much cleaner burning than wood and also somewhat cleaner burner than charcoal, so there's health benefits as well. Um, and we see also that there's a big market opportunity in this sector. Uh, as we just discussed, the market for charcoal is huge and the market for cooking fuel in general is huge. There's very low barriers to entry. You readily can get available production technology, whether you import it from Asia or uh, have it locally made. The competition is very fragmented and there's very few strongly branded products. Um, the briquettes are easy to use and a close substitute to charcoal and there's cost savings to consumers which helps your selling proposition. The disadvantages are that there are low cost alternatives. Uh, quite often people can get uh, free firewood um, by collecting it themselves or the, the charcoal is lower cost in the market. Um, there's limited consumer awareness of briquettes uh, so education is needed. Um, also, solid biomass fuels are not viewed as modern by many policymakers, so it can be difficult to get government support for the sector and quite often not treated um, preferentially like other uh, renewable energies might be. Um, there, there is some consumer behavior modification that is required to use briquettes, so again, education is necessary to have the consumer understand how to use them. And probably the biggest challenge is distributing to household consumers. Um, you basically would need to recreate the, uh, the, the charcoal uh, supply chain, which is difficult and charcoal vendors are not likely to take on a, um, a competing product uh, when they sell their next to selling their charcoal. So uh, one of the biggest challenges is coming up for inno innovative ways to distribute to these household consumers. So that's what we want to talk about today is uh, what some of these different business models are and what the different markets look like. Uh, and so we are um, going to now turn it over to our presenters. Uh, as I said, our first presenter is Marianne Jenga from World Agroforestry and University of Nairobi. And Mary, I'm going to stop sharing and let you share your screen now. Okay. Hello. Is it is it sharing now, Sylvia? Yes, it is sharing. Just you want to put it in presentation mode. Okay. So, um, hello, everybody. I want to give you a few examples of the opportunities and challenges on uh, community-based and uh, small-scale charcoal briquette enterprises, mostly from cases from Kenya. And uh, I will also take circular bioeconomy perspectives, uh, resource reuse and recovery. This presentation has been put together by a number of people 
and I want to say thanks for all the inputs. Let me start off by looking at the very uh, basic technologies that communities are used are using here in Kenya, urban areas, about 50% of the urban population lives in informal settlements and uh, community groups, they are taking advantage of turning waste into briquettes. One of the examples is recovering charcoal dust, which is the waste uh, from the charcoal value chains, mostly found in the trading places. And uh, these groups are mixing that charcoal dust with clay or charcoal dust with paper, biodegradable paper, all with a starch, like corn starch. And depending on how they make it, the combinations, the amounts of raw materials and the types, uh, the quality is so varied. You know, you get some briquettes with high calorific value, high heat value, very low emissions like charcoal dust and soil. If you mix charcoal dust plus paper, it has higher volatile matter. And uh, what we are finding is that uh, they are, this community is actually uh, making livelihood out of this in the urban areas and uh, generating uh, an affordable fuel for many people. And uh, the next example that I want to uh, talk about is really also looking at how uh, these enterprises are being turned into enterprises that are contributing a lot to women empowerment. One of the examples also is, uh, I want to give the case of Radia, who is uh, located in uh, Maimahio, around Naivasha, 100 kilometers west of Nairobi. And uh, this, this is a very personal story I want to share. In 2009, when I was working with International Potato Center, one of my colleagues came to me and said, I have my daughter who had just completed high school and looking for something to turn into an enterprise. And the briquette you have been talking about with communities, I think is one of them. And I said, have you talked to her? Does she like it? Okay. And so the dad said, please, how can she start? She needs the skills. By then, I didn't have a training manual. I wrote to the dad step by step how Lady was going to make the briquettes from charcoal dust to start with. And then she, she started the business with very simple technologies. And then she found the challenge that charcoal dust is not enough. And she called me. And we said, okay, let's try also carbonizing macadamia shells, carbonize uh, crop residues. And then she did that. Radius Enterprise has grown. Today, she's producing 10 tons of charcoal briquettes per month with a profit of about 30%. She's selling to chicken hatcheries to keep chicks warm to household. She has employed four people, two men, two women. And she has generated income and bought a piece of land where she is growing hay for sale. The other one is uh, just an example of non-carbonized briquettes that uh, uh, Sylvia talked about. And this is mostly being used for industrial use. King's Biofuels, located in Dika, is producing 200 tons per month of non-carbonized briquettes and selling mostly for industrial use. And she's selling to paint industries, to cotton makers, and she just went into an agreement with Kenya Development, Sea Development Authority, and where she's able to, um, where he's going to, the, the, the factories, tea factories are going to give him an order where he can supply these. And uh, we are replicating this in Ghana, and in Ghana, we have this machinery set up. We've done a lot of trials, public-private partnership. And the company is going to produce 1,000 tons of briquettes per year, mostly for outdoor use, like batik production and fish smoking. The other example is an example I really like to. It's 
nature-based solution. This is an example of the eco charcoal. Uh, an eco charcoal, this is a briquette enterprise owned by Beatrice and her husband. What Beatrice is doing is managing dry red forests through natural regeneration. She gets small, small twigs and she carbonizes them with a drum, combine that with cassava starch and make briquettes. And She's able to sell 1.5 tons of these charcoal briquettes at about 20 to 40% profit. And Beatrice plans to train the community around her place in the dry rats to harvest tree prunings and sell to her as a source of income and also as a raw material for her enterprise. And um, the last example is so soft. Uh, based on the same perspective. It's really about uh, bioenergy, uh, ecology. This is a project that we are working with Wildlife Works, National Museums of Kenya, and Wild Agroforestry. And we are looking at communities harvesting the twigs again, carbonize them, and they are crushed, combined with the starch, and then uh, produce charcoal briquettes. We are looking at how to enhance the productivity, reduce waste, reduce emissions. And this is taking place in a Kasigao Corridor Red Cross project, reducing emissions from degradation and deforestation. <clears throat> a conservancy. In a conservancy, charcoal briquettes being produced sustainably. And this area is subdivided into about uh, one uh, of a thousand blocks where the, the, the harvesting of wood happens in one block and then the next in a rotation manner. And we are harvesting like 25% of the pruning, 50%. And we're also looking at what is the implication of that? Mary, you are on mute, unfortunately. Could you unmute, please? Mary, you accidentally muted yourself. Sorry about that, Nisha. Really sorry. Okay. <laughs> so just uh, in conclusion, in conclusion, what I want to say is that uh, this briquette enterprises within Kenya is within a certain governing and regulatory system. It's falling under the East African Regional Bioeconomy Strategy, Bioenergy Strategy in Kenya. Kenya has developed sustainable charcoal and carbonized briquettes regulations or standards, mainly looking towards uh, mainly looking towards certification. To end this uh, talk, I want to say that we have to look at effective value chain linkages, where the raw material is coming, is it linked to briquette producers and the markets? And then we have to look at issues of technology upscaling and scaling up technology. We really need to be careful that it keeps gender uh, integration. We don't want mechanization that then women are taken out women has to be included. The briquette technology has to take advantage of the global agenda. For example, contributing to affordable clean energy, food security, health, climate change, and most importantly, it has to contribute to conservation of terrestrial ecosystems. And we have seen this is possible. Thank you so much. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Mary. That's great. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Um, Matthew, I think uh, Mary has already unshared her screen. So if you want to, um, Matthew Owen is next from, and he's going to talk a little bit about Chardust. Go ahead, Matthew. Thanks, Sylvia. How's that? Can you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Sylvia. I'm just going to talk from the perspective of uh, our company, also in, in Kenya. Sorry, a little bit heavy, heavy on Kenya examples today. Um, our company called Chadas Limited and some of the challenges and opportunities we've seen in this space. Uh, my name's Matthew. I'm one of the company's three directors. So background to our company, we've been in business over 20 years now. Uh, three of us started the company back in 1999. Um, Elson Kastad is a Canadian, John is a Kenyan, and myself, I'm British, we're all in Kenya at the time. So we've been in, in the business a while. We built it on the back of uh, Elson and John's uh, chicken uh, business because that became our first and biggest customer. And then we extended to other sectors as, as I will present. Our main product is uh, the catchily named Vendor's Waste Briquette. It's just a standard charcoal briquette made from dust and fines that we salvage from charcoal traders within Nairobi city. Um, and we have also made some premium products by um, pre-sorting the raw material, which I'll explain. Um, we sell fire lighters and also water heaters that use our fuel. At our peak, we employed about 70 people uh, and we had about 200 tons of sales per month entirely into uh, local markets within 50 kilometers of, of Nairobi. Um, the operation is based, as I say, on the salvage of dust and fines, the sort of um, sub about uh, two centimeter pieces of charcoal that go through the holes in the standard domestic charcoal stove. So these figures, of course, uh, will vary depending on who you ask, but assuming there's about 1500 tons a day of charcoal consumed in Nairobi, and as much as 10% of that uh, gets discarded, you've got an accumulation rate of as much as 150 tons a day. Of, of this material. And that's what we've been using as our feedstock. So um, we take delivery in bulk. Uh, we pay for that material. We buy it from charcoal traders, deliver with our own trucks. Um, we sieve it with a three millimeter steel sieve. Um, the stuff that goes through is already good enough to briquette. The chunks that stay on top need milling. We've got a modified uh, maize mill to do that. Uh, we mix. Um, either with, uh, with binders, depending on the type of product we're making, we make about three different grades, but we, we mix it together and we briquette, usually using a pillow briquetta, um, as you can see pictured there. And, uh, and we dry outdoors in the sun and we pack and deliver as far as possible in bulk to, to keep the delivery costs as low as possible. Um, the main product we make is made with a pillow briquetta. So that produces a 35 gram sort of piece of soap type of briquette. Um, we've also got an agglomer a few agglomerators which make a, a spherical briquette, which uses a, um, single phase electricity, only has a half horsepower motor. It's more accessible, it's a cheaper machine, um, but you need binders for this because it's a, it's a low pressure method. So you end up spending more on, on the binders, be it starches or molasses or whatever you're going to use. So there's some trade-offs there. We've also uh, used in the past extruders to make a cylindrical briquette. Uh, that extruder we had made locally in Kenya, uh, they're internationally available ones. There's a lot more wear and tear with those machines and you do spend a long time refacing the screw, spend uh, a lot of money on welding rods and electricity to do that. Um, and we make our standard briquette, uh, which we sell in bulk in 50 kilo sacks for about $11. We have a, a couple of premium or barbecue type products, which we sell through um, retail outlets and supermarkets, uh, a spherical one selling a four kilo box, equivalent of about $2.75. And I mentioned the fire lighters earlier, which are sort of sawdust mixed with paraffin wax. Um, and our main markets, um, restaurants and tourist camps, uh, obviously has been pre-COVID, a big, a big industry in, in East Africa and Kenya in particular, for space heating at outdoor warmers, um, and for water heating as well uh, in, in tented camps and places like that and in, in kitchens in hotels and lodges. Um, a big market I think as Mary mentioned is to keep uh, chicks warm in poultry houses, um, especially the day old chicks up to about the six weeks of age when they get slaughtered uh, need to be kept quite warm at night. It's good for that. Um, we sell through supermarkets, in, as I mentioned, in the small bag sizes, uh, mainly for a kind of barbecue market. And we, we have tried uh, to target the mass domestic market for regular household cooking. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Our, our, our most successful market has been the poultry farms, Nairobi being 
um, nearly 2,000 meters above sea level. It gets quite cold at night, especially from June through to September. So that's uh, is a big need for space heating. Um, and the other markets, um, equally restaurants, tourist camps, and the barbecue market. The the mass domestic market has proven quite challenging for us over the 20 years we've been trying to penetrate this. We, as you can see from the picture, we even had dedicated sales kiosks at one time to try and get into this market. Um, so a few challenges and opportunities, and I'll start with that one. One, one, one of the challenges we have faced is uh, basic performance limitations. And, you know, briquettes are, are not charcoal. They have some good and they have some bad. Uh, they burn for longer. Uh, they burn in a more predictable way and they burn very steadily, but they produce more ash in general, um, unless you're looking at very high grade extruded briquettes. They have higher ash, um, normally a lower heating value, and they do tend to be more sensitive to moisture and handling, and you can't jump around on the bags, throw them off and on lorries, and you can't extinguish, extinguish the fuel after you've cooked. Uh, it it uh, will disintegrate if you do that. Um, as a business, we've tried to get around that by pre-selecting the material for very high quality. Uh, we, we, I, I pictured the sieving that we go through. Uh, we, we do some floating, we do hand sorting, uh, and, and we really try and get the best and purest chunks of charcoal. Um, and in our marketing, we've really tried to accept the fact this isn't a direct substitute for charcoal, but there are some markets where actually the slow burn and the steady heat output are more preferred. And for having a fuel that burns around mining areas in outdoor restaurants, for example, or having a fuel that works for poultry houses at night, the slow burn is actually a plus and, and helps you penetrate that market because you want a long, steady, predictable um, output of heat. Um, second challenge we've had, um, you know, when you're, when you're operating a formal business with an office and everyone can see what you're doing, you are open to um, being hit by all manner of fees, licenses, taxes, environmental management, uh, then kind of NEMA audits, uh, industrial training levy, city council taxes, VAT, which is 16% in Kenya. Um, that's very inconsistently applied in the informal sector. So you find yourself competing with a, a regular charcoal, which is certainly not taxed to the same extent. They are taxed, of course they are. There's uh, movement permits, the cess payments, there's producer fees, and it's a minefield for them as well. Add it up, uh, we need about 18 different licenses to operate. Um, so that one-sided. Um, we tried to do uh, tackle that by keeping our costs as low as we possibly can. We share our business premises with uh, three other companies, uh, one of which is a shareholder in Chardas to try and share back office uh, costs. Um, we get our raw material from the city and our market mainly in the city. So we've minimized our haulage distances. That's one way we can uh, keep costs down against regular charcoal. Um, we've only ever used pre-carbonized feedstock. So the charcoal is already carbonized. We've tried to work uh, with sugar companies, um, with macadamia companies and with others to carbonize. We found the extra step is just too costly. So we've um, gone back to where we began, which is, which is with charcoal dust. And we generally target business to business sales. We sell to poultry farmers, we sell to restaurants, we sell direct to supermarkets. We don't sell through a distribution channel. Uh, we distribute everything ourselves with our own vehicles. And that's to try and avoid the inevitable 30% markup or whatever it is you're going to get at each node in the distribution chain. Um, and I also say operate like you mean business. Um, quite a few people in this space have benefited from from grants or from uh, donor assistance, but you, you really have to operate as if you mean business and if you are a business and, and not uh, operate as if uh, everything came in your lap for free because you're gonna have to pay to maintain and upkeep all that equipment. And I think one thing you can do as a business is try to lobby for removal of VAT on briquettes, which didn't used to be there in Kenya, but it came in in the early 2000s. And lastly, um, we are definitely facing a growing shortage of feedstock. Um, few reasons for that. There's a lot more people briquetting, that's for sure. There's a big demand for biochar for agriculture now. And the charcoal value chain has changed where a lot more people are now delivering direct to final customers rather than taking fuel into wholesaling sites and repacking it, which used to be where we would pick up a lot of our raw material. So the supply is definitely getting harder to come by and that's pushing up costs and, and leads to tighter margins. The way we've approached it, and I'm not saying this is necessarily everyone's appropriate solution, but we've we've been obliged to target this kind of small size retail markets, 
higher end outlets, by which I mean the, the restaurants, the high end shops, the, the supermarkets. Um, and if we can, customers in the tourism business were more eco conscious. Um, uh, we found it harder and harder just to compete price wise with regular charcoal. So those are, have been our approaches. So in summary, there are some performance limitations of charcoal and there are some constraints because your competition is weakly regulated and feedstock is, is tricky to come by, but you can still make money in this business. If you focus on the quality of your product, you do what I'm calling smart niche marketing. You pick where you offer a better product at a better price and you adopt a business like no frills approach. Uh, you can still flourish in this, in this space. So I hope to end on an optimistic note. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back to Sylvia. Thank you, Matthew. That's that was great. Uh, really appreciated those comments. We're getting a lot of questions that we'll have for you Thank afterwards. You. Um, Thanks. <laughs> so um, next we have Ziwa up. Uh, Ziwa from Green Bioenergy in Kampala, Uganda. Ziwa, can you share your screen now? Well, we're not seeing you yet. Great. Thank you, Ziwa. Um, I think you're still might be still on mute though. Ziba, you're still muted. Unmute your mic. Thank you, Sylvia. Great, thank you. Uh, I had to change locations to find a better internet connection. Eh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's good to know that um, everyone is here and they're listening in. My name is uh, Ziwa Hillington, Managing Director at uh, uh, Green Bioenergy. Um, I've been with the organization for about nine years, um, and the company was founded by Vincent Kinsler and Alexandra Rory. Uh, the two come from France. Uh, the main objective for them to start Green by Energy was to, first of all, the idea of social development, and then secondly, finding uh, cooking solutions that can mitigate climate change um, and deforestation. <clears throat> of course, with that excitement in 2011, as uh, soon as 2012, uh, Green Bioenergy launched the Brichetti brand uh, on the market in 2012. The idea was that <clears throat> people would quickly get to know about this new eco-friendly cooking uh, solution. But uh, we did not only stop at uh, launching briquettes on the market. Uh, we also realized that we could sensitize and mobilize more people if we did trainings on the same thing that we are doing. Uh, it's more like replicating what Green Bioenergy does either on large scale or small scale with the idea that people will get to know about briquettes. By then, when we started, there were barely no, no companies in Uganda that were doing it on large scale. I think it was about one or two of, or two, one or three companies, rather three companies that were doing it. One was producing non carbonized briquettes, and then another startup that was producing carbonized briquettes. Uh, and so we became the third uh, to intubate on the market. Um, and so we thought if many people got to know about it, there would be more sensitization because we started by selling one kilogram. Um, in 2013, after realizing that uh, stoves would uh, be a good supplement to the briquettes, uh, we launched the briquette eco stove. Um, this time around with a modified version, more holes so that briquettes can burn properly after realizing the improved cook stoves that were on the market uh, had a challenge. You know, every time they would put in briquettes because of a few holes, uh, there was less efficiency. <clears throat> and then on a global level, strategic level, uh, we have had partners like, you know, Social Business and Angie that have provided data and technical support 
to green barrier energy during its start. Of course, the prominence that we have right now is based on such partners like the UNO Social Business, Angie Harvest Fuel Initiative, and several others who were interested in discovering uh, the potential of uh, the briquetting sector. Currently, we produce an average of 60 tons uh, per month, similar to all in use for a lot of uh, charcoal dust waste. <clears throat> and we, we work with an organized community uh, community uh, group in you know in different locations. So several women will collect this waste from the trenches together. Then we organize a truck, go Kono. We have automated machinery that is our engines. We have what we call an extruder. We have a mix. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a crusher. I would say that's a complete line of production, not very different from what um, the previous presenter has been uh, showing. And we are directly um, employing about 30 people um, currently at, at the green at the green bioenergy. Uh, in the green bioenergy value chain, uh, specifically the production and the sales, of course, the indirect jobs to the people who are the micro entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. So, uh, um, a bit of our story line with the urban setting <coughs> and centers, um, knowing that in the urban centers, so they would, uh, they would carbonize the from the villages and bring it to the urban centers. And our first point of operation was in Kampala. At the backyard, where green bioenergy started, we started by using manual machines and producing a few kilograms. And what was so interesting is that we're into a new market that was looking for potential solutions um, were looking for alternatives. Uh, what came close to people's minds or what was or what, what was so critical to them, can we find something uh, that we can use to cook that is cheaper? Uh, they were not very much sensitized about the environment. Um, of course they are now, <clears throat> but by then they were but a bit critical. Can we find something that is cheaper. And so in 2000, 2012, we launched a marketing campaign to bring the briquette products on the market in Kampala, targeting the middle income households, the urban poor, and uh, to our mind that also the businesses would quickly uh, be a, a, good, a, a good customer. Um, we mainly thought of targeting the mass home users but before we knew also businesses came uh, came in very handy. So we are now supplying to the home users and the businesses. <coughs> and so once we launched the, the product on the market in 2012, we tried very many interventions working with, working with different partners uh, like Total, Development NGOs like Living Good, Brack, uh, to ensure that people got to know uh, about uh, the briquette product. In other words, um, the urban center became our first form of sensitization. Now, I'm going to tell you how form where we sold our product, being our first home wanted um, when they're using a fuel. <clears throat> of course, I'll skip this slide uh, on the, the clean cooking sector and the charcoal market. There's, of course, a growing need uh, of charcoal about the increasing population. Several reports uh, from local government authorities indicate a growing need for fuel 
not just for households, but also for businesses like schools. Now, when we entered, when we started our distribution, and of course the production as well, because it began in the backyard in Kampala, there were certain things we saw, uh, and these certain things, some of them still exist. Uh, they're quite a challenge generally for the bricket sector, and in Uganda, we, we will of course uh, talk together as bricket manufacturers, and these, some of the common challenges that we have been finding <clears throat> while working in the urban centers, uh, one of the, the challenges, the briquettes margin, the, the question that most people have asked us, why are you not selling to the, to the charcoal retailers? so that they also distribute your product since many people are going there. But we found out that because the margins on the briquettes are so low, the retail chain is not attracted to it. Um, and I am giving an example. Uh, you know, in Kampala, maybe a retailer would get 10,000 Ugandan shillings from selling a taco bag, and they will get about 5,000 Ugandan shillings from selling a bag of, of briquettes. But of course, briquettes, uh, you use less quantity, but explaining this to them takes a while. But getting back to what I'm saying, uh, not all shops are selling briquettes. Not all um, charcoal retailers are opting to sell briquettes because they don't find the briquette margins uh, attractive to them. Um, on the other hand, we could say that they could be happy about saving the environment but that, that comes as a sort of like a second priority for them. The first priority is about money. <clears throat> then the other challenge that is quite interesting uh, is about customer financing innovation. I think it's been so tough through time to actually uh, innovate around financing. We know that c customers can adopt a product if you have proper financing. And that's why we worked with organizations like Brack before Living Goods. <clears throat> But because of low margins still, it becomes very hard. Uh, imagine if I have to sell out, let's say $14 or $14, $14, $50 kilograms, $14 or less for 50 kilograms, and I have to ask, let's say, a person who will pay two times or three times, it becomes quite a tough uh, journey for, for us as a business because the materials, for example, you're buying will have to be bought on cash in most cases. So as even when we know that customer finance can unlock uh, the market and look, it's quite tough. Um, so far what we have done is work offer credit to micro entrepreneurs who will pay maybe at, at the end of month, but end, end user customer financing is still, is still a challenge. But we know if there's some unlocking, uh, Possibly the urban poor can also adopt to briquettes. Another interesting challenge uh, is about product technology match. Of course, when we are marketing out the briquettes to the urban centers, uh, and especially let's talk about the markets. Uh, like in Uganda, you have big markets that bring people together, and it's it's, it's quite annoying um, that you will find that people are still using. Uh, the rudimentary stoves. And so when you try to promote the briquettes in these markets, the bigger markets where people are congregating, where they cook food for, for the people, the challenge you find is that people are still using the poor technologies. Um, and so even when we say briquettes can burn in every stove, they're actually efficient in, in improved cook stoves. Otherwise, it be, in other words, it becomes very hard for people to realize, see the actual benefit of briquettes unless they're using the improved cook stove. And it's so common now that we're even targeting schools in the urban centers. One game changer has been that they have, the institutional cook stoves can now use both, both firewood and briquettes. So that market is opening up. Otherwise, if it wasn't for that, you would still have challenges around Product, product and the technology match for schools. It's still a challenge, I would, I would still uh, confirm, especially for the households, until possibly we have all households adopting and uh, 
getting and getting improved cookstoves in their home. The other part is about financing policy. Um, and here we are seeing there's no consistent and supplementary financing mechanism for the sustainable charcoal promotion <clears throat> in urban centers. Um, and what we what I mean by this is that we were hoping if there is a launch of you know a pro product sensitization, it can continue beyond a project li lifespan uh, because most of the, the the financing policies are looking at implementing projects that will end within one year. And yet we know that behavioral change and adoption takes a long while. So possibly people will see because of a specific financing that has come in, um, that the government has allocated, a program that has been promoted by the Global Alliance for 12 months. Once, once that ends, there's barely no financing to still promote you know, the, the products that you've been putting on the market. And, and what happens, businesses can only do so much in terms of massive uh, sensitization. We are limited in terms of the financing. And I guess this goes back to the financing policies that are existing. And then there's unfair pricing. Basically having an unorganized group at Green Bioenergy that you pay monthly salary, uh, take care of their social benefits, and you're competing with a uh, with a, a charcoal retailer that possibly they don't pay a lot of licenses in actual sense. Um, on the other hand, they are not even registered anywhere. Uh, they will come put up a shelter somewhere. And so that competition becomes very hard. I would, I would reach to a point where I'm having a, a fair, a sustainable pr pricing, but it becomes very hard because the main competition landscape is not even. Uh, um, yeah. See, so are you still there? Seems like we've temporarily lost Ziwa. We'll give him one second here to try to get back. Okay, I, I guess we're Ziwa was unshared. Um, sorry, we didn't hear your conclusion there, Ziwa, but um, we'll, we'll move on now uh, to Dorothy Otiena, Otieno. Uh, Dorothy, do you want to share your screen now? Yes, Sylvia, thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Just want to put it in presentation mm -hmm. mode. There you go. Is that okay? Yes. Just, just go to your beginning, there you go. Okay, thank you so much. And um, thanks to all the presenters and all the participants in this webinar today. Uh, my name is Dorothy and uh, I'm from Nyalore Impact Limited. We are a clean energy, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we are a clean energy enterprise working in rural Kenya in Homa Bay County. I wouldn't want to go so much into this slide, so much has been talked about it. And Nyalore is just a simple Luo name, meaning it's possible. And I've said we work in rural Kenya and um, we have been in this space since 2016, working in the rural areas. And uh, we were motivated uh, to start producing uh, clean cooking products, uh, cook stoves and briquettes to be able to assure the community of the quality of the products. And um, our solutions, um, mainly Jiko Digi and uh, Digi briquettes, which are made from recycled waste material by our local artisans 
in order to make the products more affordable to the rural community that um, we try to serve. And these are actually the bottom of the pyramid uh, households. Uh, our impact to date, we, we, uh, we can say, has been to provide uh, clean cooking solutions to the households who are main, the main target of uh, our business. We also have also improved health and the environment and improved household savings since the briquettes are more cheaper than uh, the normal charcoal and firewood that uh, most households depend on. We have also educated the community about the benefits of um, cooking with the uh, charcoal briquettes. Our value proposition to the households that we target is um, less emissions or smokeless uh, charcoal briquettes that they use to cook in their homes. And they have more uh, fuel efficient using uh, briquettes because of the thermal efficiency of the briquettes. And comparing the briquettes to um, the firewood that is normally used on a three stones, we say we have improved the safety of the households. We are very much focused on uh, working with uh, women in our um, business model, because most women or women are the end users of the cooking products in their homes and involving them in the process is very key to us, both in the production of the briquettes and in the production of the cook stoves. So they are among the trained uh, members of the community anytime we are doing any project or any activity. So to date, we have worked with uh, 300 women and mainly these women are vulnerable women or teenage mothers. You know, the challenges of uh, the rural communities. And the challenges of um, adopting or community accepting to take up the charcoal briquettes is mainly in the rural people are very, very much um, into their traditional ways of cooking or their cultural beliefs. And so behavior change, like just like um, my other present, the other presenters have talked about, behavior change is, is, is quite different. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult and takes a bit of time. And we you really need to educate the community on the importance or why they need to change from their traditional ways of cooking because to them, uh, health is never a problem to them. So you cannot really sell on emissions. You really have to find other reasons, which the, the main reason that they look at is the cost over their health issues. So and the, the other, challenge that uh, contributes to the energy poverty in the households. Uh, I wouldn't want to re re uh, repeat everything. It's lack of accessibility of um, the briquettes in the rural because um, it is not as available as uh, firewood and charcoal right interior into the very difficult places to reach in the rural areas. Then as uh, an SME, what are the challenges? And um, of course, finance is still a very, very big challenge. And um, it is cross-cutting in many other areas like uh, acquiring good machinery. And when we are operating in a rural place, it means that even when you have any mechanical breakdown of the machine, then you have to transport it to another bigger city for it to be repaired or to get its part, parts um, fixed. And this really makes it difficult to be able to compete and um, really do business in the rural areas. The other difficulty and challenge that we face is um, 
lack the lack of technicians. If we had more technicians locally available, it would be easier for us to be able to work more efficiently and um, assure our market of a more sustainable supply of uh, charcoal briquettes and uh, reduce or make our prices more affordable. And um, the lack of machinery also means that um, then our products cannot also be very, very competitive in other markets uh, because we, we, we are so limited on finances and um, technology on many, many uh, aspects of improving the quality of our product. Uh, I would also like to touch on uh, COVID-19 and how it has affected us. And before COVID, the opportunities in the bricket sector was were just many and we had customers who had really appreciated the charcoal briquettes for their saving uh, values, for their health benefits and availability. And there was also high demand from the households of the charcoal briquettes. And especially, especially when children returned back from home and we were on lockdown. And uh, the raw material was still accessible and things were going on well, but um, we have faced a lot of challenges uh, since COVID because um, revenue is still a challenge. Most of our customers, as I have told you, are rural communities, rural households who do not have so much money to spend and with competing priority during lockdown and COVID uh, time, it was very, very difficult for households to continue affording a cook stove and uh, purchase briquettes because normally they are used to using the three stone. So uh, business has really, really gone down while the prices and um, access to the raw material has also become very, very costly. So we have also found that um, most households then have gone back to using firewood because they have free labor, they have children back at home who can help them collect as the parents look for the food to cook. And uh, that brought us actually to a, a standstill. We were not able to sell anything for quite some time until things started um, opening up again. But unfortunately, uh, our situation is kind of deteriorating and um, uh, people, schools have closed and children are back home. So this might also start posing another challenge to us again. So all in all, we are still in business, but with a lot of challenges, especially in the rural areas. And our contribution to the SDGs um, as charcoal briquette producers in the rural, we look at uh, two main or three, but we are cutting across the several that are mentioned here, the gender equity and affordable energy for all. We also try so much to improve the health of the households by giving them briquet, charcoal briquettes, which are less on the emissions. The actions that we think would really help improve the sector uh, for the stakeholders is um, we are looking at government, increase awareness of cooking, of clean cooking solutions and give priority to things like um, charcoal briquettes, just like they have, the government of Kenya has done in the past with LPG and um, also build the SME capacity in operating in, in operational and uh, financial terms, make more finances available to people who are uh, SMEs who are uh, doing charcoal briquettes production, and also consider women in the in the in the financial offers. Enable 
charcoal briquette producers to measure their social, environmental, and economic impact in their work. This is a very, very big challenge for SMEs to do because um, there's quite a, some money that you need to put in the surveys and people to do for you all this work to be able to carry out these uh, surveys and really be able to measure your social impact in the community. Then we, we, we would also imagine if the government and the other stakeholders would, would prioritize uh, clean cooking in the education curriculum, just like um, other, other, other issues have been incorporated into the school curriculum, like uh, the sexual education. I believe even um, clean cooking can really help change behavior for the youths right from a tender age, even as they go through school and have uh, clean cooking prioritized would really help us to show and train our young ones that uh, it's good to take care of the environment and the ways that they can do this and uh, increase the tree cover. Then the other um, point is prioritize funding for the clean cooking sector to increase energy access, especially in the rural areas, because in Kenya we have 93% of the rural community who really depend on uh, biomass for their cooking and prioritizing uh, funding in, for rural areas would really help a long way in uh, addressing the cooking issues also for the rural population. And in fact, in Homa Bay, I should mention that we have, we are currently at 2% tree cover. So meaning our, 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 our place is almost dry. We have areas where people are actually cooking with shrubs. Others are even using plastic to cook their meals because there's no more firewood or firewood has become very, very expensive. And so that means even charcoal is not available. So I think also if um, the government and our leaders, political leaders would start prioritizing clean cooking in this political space, this would really help in um, making charcoal briquettes, the clean cook stoves more, uh, something that to be something that can be appreciated and prioritized in the even at the household levels and something that can uh, improve lives of the community and um, uplift the living standards of um, the households and the community at large and on the sector side um, the issues that the actions that would need attention is improved measurement of the impact, just like from the stakeholder side. And then data is um, a really big issue today because uh, we, we would like to know, and uh, every time it is a debate of how much charcoal briquettes is produced in Kenya, for example, even if we wanted people to change from using normal charcoal to briquettes. These statistics is very, very difficult to get because of the lack of data. And also, as we collect data, it would also be good if um, agenda less can be applied to it to know exactly what, how, how are women also incorporated in uh, this or how many women are actually involving in uh, the clean energy entrepreneurship. Then would also need an action on um, developing a network support for the SMEs who are producing briquettes and um, an association like UBPA then can advocate for the SMEs who are pro uh, charcoal briquettes producers in a more in a better way that they could be, we could all then receive some attention and uh, achieve some some of the challenges addressed and uh, focus on uh, 
improving the quality of our businesses and enterprises. In conclusion, um, as the population grows, forests uh, cover will reduce, and so firewood and charcoal will be reduced even more. And charcoal briquette is already appreciated. It's only that we need to really concentrate so much and educate the community, especially the, the rural communities who have very, very little money to spend on clean cooking solutions. And also they don't have a variety of the clean cooking solutions because their purchasing power is low. And most of the times the only other cooking solution that they can afford is a, 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 an improved cook stove and maybe something like uh, charcoal briquettes. So when you compare the price of charcoal, uh, a tin may, many times our rural household think it is cheaper, but you find that charcoal is that there are people who have measured this and um, they have told us that um, a tin weighs 1.3 kgs and is sold at between 0 0.7 to $1, while a kg of briquettes is mainly between. 20, $0.25 dollars to about um, $0.4 dollars for most of the producers, depending on where they are, they are doing their business. And so charcoal briquette, if given attention, could actually help increase um, savings in households and also increase health and also improve the environment and reduce the pressure on um, the natural resources. Uh, we would also, there's also uh, an opportunity if you have the right business model of combining uh, the efficient cook stoves and the charcoal briquette, it works better, especially in the rural areas because uh, rural, the rural communities depend so much on uh, the three stone and even if you produce charcoal briquettes without pairing it up with the efficient cook stoves, then the uptake will be low because they cannot use uh, briquettes on, on the three stone. Uh, and partnering with the local organization to increase business in rural community is really something that we have learned in the rural in the recent past, especially after COVID. We have um, try to partner with uh, many organizations uh, in uh, our effort also to like involve more women in the briquetting process because if charcoal is reducing, then that means we don't even have the charcoal dust anymore. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to see how we can use agricultural waste and use women to be the ones to collect for us the, the agricultural residues, then we can carbonize and uh, do the processing and to produce the charcoal briquettes. This way, we, we believe we will be able to involve women and increase their opportunities to make some little uh, money and also appreciate the briquettes even more because it, they are involved in the process of uh, the, the, the production of the charcoal briquettes that they use back at home and really need to cook for their families. And uh, people in the peri-urban centers are, they're not most, they're, they are most receptive because they are a little enlightened and, and like the people who live right interior in the villages that we are not able to penetrate. And we know that, um, for us to be able to penetrate these places, it will be very, very expensive because of the poor infrastructure, especially road, and uh, the means of transport is not there. And But if we can be able to reach briquettes to uh, the nearest centers, it will open up the market and make briquettes more receptive, even in the more rural communities, uh, because then, 
briquettes would be like uh, paraffin and uh, charcoal, which is just available in the next shop outside their houses or to their nearest doors. Uh, thank you very much for that. I hope anyone with a question can answer. Thank you, Sylvia, back to you. <laughs> thank you, Dorothy, that was great. Um, I'm gonna reshare my screen um, and find it. Oh, maybe not. Okay, let me share this one. Okay, that was um, that was a uh, great presentation we had there, um, and uh, we really appreciate all of you guys uh, chiming in. We did have a number of questions in the chat and there were uh, a couple of different conversations going on. Uh, so I'm gonna um, just uh, pose a couple of questions based off the chat conversation to some of our panelists here. And I'm gonna start with a, a question that was um, uh, posted early on in the beginning about um, how to extinguish briquettes and whether they can be reused. Uh, um, Mary and... Um, um, Matthew had slightly different answers on that. So um, Mary, would you unmute and, and, and just discuss that briefly and then we'll turn it over to Matthew. Yeah, uh, I think when it comes to reusing briquettes, what we are finding is that uh, households normally extinguish it you know, they want to use it just like the way they use charcoal. And so what they do is that uh, they get the briquettes once it has cooked well, then they, uh, they shake it a bit to shake out some of the ashes and then they cover it with something uh, like a cooking pot or that, and then extinguishes oxygen. That way they, uh, they, they stop it from burning and then they can be able to reuse it. Because if you use water, then it disintegrates, it becomes wet, very difficult to write again, but yes, it is being uh, extinguished, but you have to cut off the oxygen instead of using a liquid. Over to you, Sylvia. Okay, uh, Matthew, do, did you want to uh, say something about that as well? Yeah. Oh, that, that extinguishes made so many modern so you, you need to be perhaps enthusiastic and in the briquette um i'm sorry matthew you are cutting out um sorry, try one was... more time oh, yeah no i just agree with what mary said if you extinguish with water it will dis. okay, uh, okay. So um, while we have you, Matthew, um, the, the next question we're gonna talk about is, um, is binders. There's a lot of interest in what binders people were using. Um, it sounds like you've tried different ones. Um, could you just talk about a couple of them and what you think works best for which, uh, which type of briquette or which type of use? Yeah, we've tried really fancy ones. We used to try that were briquettes long time. We tried PVA, the stuff, glossy pepper, gloss. Um, so in our standard grade briquette, we don't use anything at all. A lot of um, the kit and trading. Our higher grade briquette, starch, as Mary said in the chat, uh, we tend to use industrial corn starch, but I think as she, if you're in a, and is fine a porridge and and it becomes like very gloopy and, and glutinous and then you can blend it in liquid form and then it, it really bakes hard um, and we have also used molasses which are excellent I smell Okay, Matthew, I, I, I'm afraid we're losing you again. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <you're> <laughs> All right. uh, 
Um, just maybe again, w w what you like about molasses, and then we'll we'll shift to Mary. Back that the briquettes will go a little bit soft over time. Uh, it makes a nice kit. And uh... okay, okay. Um, all right. So thanks, Matthew. Sorry that we didn't get um, a great recording there of, of your answer, but. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to turn the same question over to Mary now. Um, Mary, uh, you, I know you talked a lot about using soil. Could you talk a little bit about the benefits from um, the standard of um, um, from the standpoint of emissions in using soil in briquettes and how that helps get a cleaner burn? Yes, um, we have been fighting that. Uh, a lot of community-based uh, organizations, uh, even individuals are using, are uh, combining charcoal dust with some clay, with some soil. And what that does is that, uh, because soil doesn't burn, it uh, extends its burning period, it burns very slowly, and then it reduces emissions, uh, carbon monoxide, dioxide and even fine particulate matter. And what I want to say about use of soil, it really depends on the purpose you want. If you want to use, to have briquettes, for example, for cooking, and then uh, you want very high um, heat value, then the soil one will be very frustrating. A lot of people want the soil one maybe for heating space, you know, like in restaurants, all for keeping chicken warm, things like that. But what we have found even in the informal settlements, actually they are using charcoal dust plus soil. It burns so slowly and they say then they are able to cook, for example, with just very little amount, like less than 500 grams to cook maize and beans that burns for three hours without uh, adding any more. But it's uh, good to be, con uh, be careful about using soil because it really depends on the purpose you want it to be for. Uh, if you mix then charcoal dust and, uh, for example, gum arabica or cassava, uh, cassava starch that you just crush cassava and boil it in water and use that paste, then you find that it has higher heating value than the soil one. Over to you, Sylvia. Okay, Thank, thanks, Mary. Um, now, actually, I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, both uh, Ziwa and um, and uh, Dorothy um, have made or currently make uh, cook stoves to go with um, their briquettes, and uh, I wanted them each to talk a little bit about how they design their cook stoves to maximize the performance of the briquettes. Um, Ziwa, do you want to start? I know you're not current. I don't think you're currently making the cook stoves anymore, but can you talk a little bit about the process you um, went through before? Hopefully Ziwa's. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I hope the internet works. Um, we actually still make cook stoves, but on, on, uh, on a lesser scale. Um, for schools, what hello can Olivia am I clear or? yes you are clear you're crystal clear thank you so so for the schools we are building institutional cook stores and <laughs> we are changing we are modifying the the, the the charcoal pot to use both firewood and and and, and charcoal by uh, expanding the the, the, the the holes in the grate the grate is where the, the, char the charcoal or the, the, the charcoal or the briquette sit, sit. So that, that's one option. Uh, modify the institutional cook stove to use both firewood and, and, uh, and briquettes by modifying the grate uh, where the charcoal sits. And then for the households, we still, we still promote having uh, more number of holes in the liner. The liner is also is, is where the charcoal, the charcoal or the briquette sit. In, a, in a, an improved cook stove. So if you have more number of stoves in a liner, the better the, 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 the airflow. Those are two uh, things that we have done in the previous and 
now also doing them, but especially uh, we are now concentrated on, on the institutional focus of, for the school. Okay, um, and, and Ziwa, do you find that um, you're marketing the two products together so that it's helpful to be able to say, you know, come use our briquettes and if you buy our stove, um, you'll get better performance? Yes, it's, it's indeed true. I, I'll, I'll definitely say this. It's true that you need to market the briquettes and the stoves uh, together. Um, it's, it's very important uh, in, my, in my opinion and from GB's experience. The two move hand in hand because the stores on the market might not be compatible. Um, like I was mentioning during the presentation, even when we assume that you know all, all briquettes will be used in every store, like unless you have salespeople who are going to monitor the, the person at home all the time, it will require you to work upon a stove and sell it along with the with the briquettes. Uh, I recommend as such. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Ziba. Dorothy, um, do you, can you add anything about how your stoves are designed and how you how that um, helps with your briquette performance? Hey, Sylvia, yes, we produce our own cook stoves. And we have designed them in such a way that um, they can either use briquettes or firewood because those are the most commonly used um, fuels in the rural area. And uh, when it is just for briquettes alone and for firewood alone, then it will become more expensive to the rural communities that we target. So we try to be very sensitive to their uh, financial situations and also design something that can be used by either the fuels. And this also gives us um, a, a, an advantage over our competitors in the, in the business in that um, then the rural community can find more uh, value for their money in, their, in our products and have more trust in us. And then we, when we combine the stove and the briquettes, then they are, they, are, they are more appreciated that way. So our stoves are a multiple stove and uh, they go together with the briquettes and they help us to sell the briquettes also alongside the bookstores. What? What specifically about the stove is different than a standard charcoal stove? Uh, normally, the artisanal stoves that are there are just mainly for charcoal alone. Mm -hmm. So you cannot use uh, the same same stove to use uh, firewood. So that is why they depend on charcoal to cook the foods that uh, they want to make on the charcoal, like. Uh, chapati, uh, frying an egg. And then when they want to use uh, firewood, they use the three stones. So we are reducing the, the, the dependence on the inefficient stove, the three stone, by also reducing the smoke emission by the use of our stove. It is, it, it, it's designed in such a way that it has more fire inlets I mean, uh, a lot of air inlets so that when you're using the firewood, then it reduces the smoke and you remove the crate when you're using firewood. When you want to use briquettes, you put back the crate and you close some of the air inlets to allow, to allow you use the briquettes more efficiently. Thank you, that's good. Um, that um, just leads me into um, a, probably what's gonna be our final question. We still have a lot of other questions in the chat, but I think we're gonna be mindful of people's time today and just talk about this last one. Um, so Dorothy, if you can quickly, um, since we're, we're on you, um, talk just a little bit about some innovative ways that you reach out to household consumers since that is the, the most challenging market for um, for people in this sector. And um, just, just uh, one way obviously is how you combine your stove with your briquettes, but are there any other ways that um, you can recommend people uh, to reach these markets and educate consumers? 
Yes, the, the, the most important thing in the rural community is education. We know that there's a, a lot of high literacy level in the rural communities. And like I said, you can never go to sell to them on a health issue that the benefit is health. They will not even listen to you because that is not their problem. They, they, they find, they, they don't find health as, as a big problem or concern compared to what to cook. So when you tell them it will save them on the fuel consumption, then now it makes sense to them because they will reduce the amount of cooking fuel that they need, which they can now save to buy more food to cook, to feed their families. So that then makes more sense for them. So education is very, very key to the community and also holding live demonstrations where you allow them to actually witness how the charcoal briquettes burn in the cook stove. Then they can ask their questions and they receive immediate answers that builds their confidence in the product and also they have the first-hand experience of how it works. And that makes it um, easier for us to sell. And then they go, they use the word of mouth now to their groups. We also work a lot with women groups. We educate women in women groups. And through that, they are able to share what they have learned, the, the, the positive things that they have seen with other women, and it increases our sales. So a lot of groundwork has to be done before they actually come to buy. Okay, I thank you. Education. Yes, no, I think I think what you're saying is like in like in almost every other market, it it ha there has to be they have to see the value in it. It can't just be about health or environment. It needs to be about um, cost savings and um, bringing economic value to their to their family. So thank thank you very much, Dorothy, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, just we're we're um, going to uh, wrap up quickly here now, um, uh, and basically. But before we did, I wanted to just share um, the fact that we have some other uh, webinars coming up. Um, as I said in the beginning, we're we're interested in exploring in a deep way um, sustainable um, charcoal methodology and and the sector. Um, and what different solutions, whether they be briquettes or um, sustainable feedstock. And so we have a number of webinars on different topics coming up. The next one is on reforming the charcoal sector. What does this mean and who does it benefit? And we have one um, on, this is on popular demand, June 24th on kiln technology, what's available and what's needed. And then you can see the other titles that we have coming up. Uh, we do um, very much welcome your feedback on this list of topics. And if there's other things that you think um, should be um, addressed or you have suggestions for titles or um, perhaps you can bring some expertise to one of these titles, please uh, reach out to us. Um, at um, you can get info at charcoalproject.org or um, you can contact me directly at sherzog at charcoalproject.org and, and give us some of your feedback. Um, so we're gonna end our recording here now, um, but uh, like we said, we are going to um, uh, um, send all this, send this out to you, send the slides out to you, send the answers to the questions out to you because I know there's a number of things that we didn't get to in the chat. Um, but um, really appreciate you all joining us today. And um, thanks again for, uh, for being part of a, of a good discussion.